I've never been a fan of musicals. Uh, main reason is that when I'm watching, if, if I'm watching a movie and it's a musical, I always feel this dissonance because on the one hand, I'm watching the scenes play out and I'm getting to know the characters and I'm meant to invest in this, in this narrative that's taking place. I'm meant to relate to these characters as if they're real people. And then just when, just when I'm getting to that stage, just when I'm becoming engrossed in the story and the characters, suddenly they draw it back and everybody breaks out into this, in, into this, this routine and sometimes the main character is singing and dancing or a whole group of the characters are all singing and dancing together and it just shatters that illusion over and over again. And it reminds me that I'm watching a big budget production and that people have rehearsed this. And so I can't become engrossed in the movie as an experience. It's always this reminder that, oh, I'm watching a movie. The exception to this, I'd say, would be musical comedies because you're not meant to take them seriously. There's all that, uh, that, there's all that breaking down of the fourth wall and the wink and nudge to the audience. Like, think of Mel Brooks' musical comedies. They're a perfect example of those. And I can happily watch those, and they're great. You know, people laugh at them. I, I find them funny as well because they're not meant to be taken seriously. They're meant to be viewed in jest. So you can sit through the musical numbers because often well, pretty much all of, all of the, the songs that they do, that they're, they're, they're funny. The lyrics are funny. The, the actions are hilarious. Like, you can follow that. But, but uh, yeah, musicals where you're meant to take the storyline seriously, not for me. When I was a kid, though, there was one exception. Uh, there was the Disney classic Mary Poppins. I really enjoyed that movie. And to this day, I, I don't know exactly what it was. Like, there's no particular standout scene for me. Uh, I didn't have a favourite character. Like, if, if I was stretched, I think probably Bert the Chimney Sweep, uh, played by Dick Van Dyke, he would probably have been my favourite character. But it wasn't like, oh, yeah, Bert's the best. It was just, yeah, I, I didn't really have a favourite character. So, so yeah, to this day, like, what, what I actually liked about that movie is it's a bit of a mystery to me. But... Uh, there was one scene that I, that I watched back more recently and it was one of those moments where you are watching a movie or you're watching a show or something from your childhood and it resonates with you in a different way as you've got older and had more, you've had more life experience and this was one instance of it. If you, uh, if you haven't watched Mary Poppins then uh, I'm about to share a spoiler alert here so if you're hanging out to watch Mary Poppins then stop this video go watch it now and then come back to this otherwise I'm going to go ahead with this and I assume that you've watched it. The scene that I'm talking about is the scene after George Banks's son Michael has caused all that commotion at the bank he caused a run on the bank because as you remember he wanted to give his tuppence to the bird lady, but George told him to invest it at the bank. He goes in and the bank staff do this do this song and dance about investing your money wisely. And they take Michael's tuppence off him, in which at which point he tries to snatch it back and he yells, Give it back! Give me back the money! And everybody thinks that the bank isn't giving him his money, so there's a run on the bank. Yeah, big disaster. And obviously they need a scapegoat for that. So after all that commotion... That evening, back at the bank's household, George gets a call from the bank, and he's told that he's needed to come along to the bank that night for a meeting immediately. And George isn't dumb. He can read between the lines, and he realises that he's going to get the sack. And what do we know about George up to this point? He's the proud patriarch of the family. The bank's been his entire life. It's been his whole source of pride. He's worked away and he's sacrificed for that position, and it's a position that he holds with great pride. And now because of the actions of his son, he's about to lose that all. He's going to go and he's going to be sacked from his job. And it's just this, this beautiful sequence of scenes where George leaves the house and he walks through the park and he walks through the streets of London and it's dark and it's deserted. And the score to this song, Feed the Birds, is playing. And I'm, I'll provide a link to this clip down below to refresh your memory, but... What really resonated with me when I re-watched this scene is that as George leaves his house, he thinks it's the end of his life. Metaphorically speaking, it's the end of his life. It's the end of everything that he's worked for. It's the end of his greatest source of pride. His identity is a man, and it's about to be snatched away from him, and he knows that it's happening. For all intents and purposes, George is a dead man walking when he sets out into the street that night. And the beautiful thing about it, the poignant thing about it, is that he doesn't realise is that it's not the end of George Banks. In fact, he's about to be reborn. He's about to discover something that 
he might have abandoned many years before. He's about to he's he's about to, to laugh again. He's about to be reminded of the joys of being a father again. And that's what Mary Poppins' mission was. This is this is why they made that movie Saving Mr. Banks, to point out that Mary Poppins was never about the children getting the nanny that they wanted and them getting and, and the children getting the father that they wanted back. It's about George Banks realizing what's really important in life and realizing that he's become so hardened by his job and so distanced from his family. And that his kids are there and they need him. And he's about to rediscover that, you know? Like, he thinks it's his death at the time. But he doesn't realize that he is on the verge of breakthrough. On the other side of his sacking, he is going to be reborn. And we see that at the end, don't we? When they're all singing about flying kites. And uh, I think from memory, I, I think from memory, um, George is offered his job back from one of the higher ups at the bank. Because remember that the, the the elderly bank manager played by also played by Dick Van Dyke. We find out that he died laughing after George shares this joke after being basically sacked at that board meeting. George tells this joke and he starts cracking up, and then the elderly bank manager starts laughing as well. And yeah, apparently he died laughing. And yeah, I'd, I'd have to go back and rewatch this scene, admittedly, but. Uh, I think they actually offered George his, his job back at the end, but it's not really the point. It's not about whether George gets his job back at the bank or he gets a promotion or he goes and works somewhere else. The whole point is that he rediscovered the joy of fatherhood, of metaphorically and literally flying a kite with his children, doing those things, and not, uh, not losing his life while he's out trying to make a living. And that's the beauty of it. And yeah, it resonates with me because I'm sure like yourself, I've had times in my life where I felt like uh, I'd felt like I'd hit a wall. Uh, I felt like I had nowhere else to go. I felt like I was out of options and out of answers and I didn't know what to do next. And it was only with hindsight that I, that I, I can look back now and I can see that there was opportunity brewing. It was right there for me. I just, I had to go another step further. There was a saying that I heard a few years ago now that stuck with me ever since. And that saying was that sometimes opportunity looks like a man-eating lion. Sometimes the thing that's going to save us, the thing that's going to be the making of us, looks like it's going to be the end of us. It looks like it's going to be the breaking of us. And it's only through meeting it face to face, through walking through it, that we discover what it was really all about on the other side. And we couldn't see it at that point in time. I had, you know, back in when I was a senior in high school, like long story short, I'm not going to go into all the details here today, but I, at one point I was so disillusioned with just with school and with the way my life was that I was going to drop out. I was going to go, drop out and and uh, pursue my creative dreams, get a job, and because I just decided that I had enough. And it was only through talking more with uh, with friends of mine and with teachers who um, who'd got to know me that I reversed my decision and I said, you know what, I'm going to stay on, I'm going to stay through, go and do my HSC. As frustrating as it's going to be, as much as I imagine it was going to suck spending another year and a half there at school or however long I had left, that I was going to do it. And so I did it. And looking back now, I'm so grateful I did because there were a whole bunch of experiences that I wouldn't have had if I'd just skipped out then. A whole bunch of experiences that I would have missed out on and, and relationships that I wouldn't have had a chance to, um, to develop. Relationships that I still have to this day with some people. They wouldn't have happened if I'd walked away at that point in time. And I couldn't see it then. I couldn't see it as like a 16 or a 17 year old, but it was right around the corner for me. I think back also to another time in my life, and I've actually written an article about it, and I'll provide the link for you down below if you haven't read it, but in it I talk about the way that my life was when I was 25, and I again, I was just disillusioned with life, and it felt like I had no more answers. I, I didn't know the next step to take. It felt like I had nowhere else to go, and I thought back to the way that I'd imagined that my life would be at the age of 25, back when I was like 18, 19, and... Here I was at 25 and it felt like there was so much stuff that just hadn't happened and I felt like I was out of answers in a lot of ways. But it was New Year's Eve and 
I just made the decision. I said, whatever, whatever it takes, whatever I have to do to change things, to change up the way that my life is going, I will do it because I've had enough of the way things are going and I, I don't want to deal with it anymore. I've had enough of this. I'm over that. It's gone on too long. I'm going to change it. And the upshot of that was that, yeah, things didn't turn around immediately, but uh, in the next 12 months, yeah, absolutely my life changed and it got much better and I began to see green shoots appearing after this, this winter of discontent. Things started to change for me and it was actually, I'd say it was actually that decision, making that decision out of that disillusionment that uh, has led to this business existing. Part of the reason I'm making this video right now and talking here is, is because I made that decision that I was going to change things up. And starting my own business, starting this business was, was one of the, the, uh, the outcomes of that. I think even more recently to, say, 2020 when it, di it didn't feel like a man-eating lion, but there was a lot of uncertainty there for a while, regardless of, of, of how serious the virus actually seemed. And after that, a couple of months, and we started to get a better idea of what it was and, and what it wasn't, there was still this question mark about, well, what's going to happen with business? And it was, yeah, there was, there was a lot that was up in the air. At the same time, what happened was is that... Uh, because it couldn't exactly fly around like we normally did going into state or overseas is that opportunities that I would normally have had to spend thousands of dollars in airfares and accommodation for, I had presented to me literally just sitting at my computer. I was going to like four or more online meetings every week, meeting new people from all across the country. And some of those people are still colleagues that I talk to on the regular to this day and I've done plenty of business with them and they're, they're great colleagues to have. And a lot of those people I probably wouldn't have met in a normal landscape, in a normal business landscape. Or if I had met them, I would have had to have spent a lot more money to, to get in front of them. And that was an opportunity that came to me just because of, of, of the strange times that we lived in that whole year, or most of that year at least. So that was an opportunity out of that. And look, I'm sure that you can think of plenty of examples in your own life where it felt like you were a dead man or a dead woman walking. And it felt like, metaphorically, you'd hit a wall and it felt like you were out of answers and you're out of ideas and you didn't know what, uh, what your next step was. Maybe it did feel like there was a man-eating lion bearing down on you. And then somehow, through you know, a reason or an opportunity that you couldn't foresee, suddenly things turned around for you. And it's only when you look back in hindsight that you realize... What you thought was going to be the breaking of you was, in fact, the making of you. And so, yeah, that, that's why I love this scene where George Banks is walking to the bank and he thinks that, well, he does get sacked, but he thinks that that's going to be the end of him. And he doesn't see it yet. He doesn't realize that, in fact, it's not his death. He is about to be reborn. He is about to come back as something even more than the man that he was. But he just can't see it yet. And that's what makes it so poignant. So, yeah, I'll leave you with that one today, guys. But I don't know what you're going through at the moment. Uh, maybe everything's going reasonably well for you. Or maybe you are in that position where it just you're a bit uh, out of ideas and out of energy. And it feels like this could be the end for you. Or it's just you're walking into this fog and you really can't see in front of you. And maybe it's not about what's happening right now. Maybe, maybe it's about how you look at this, at this season, at this period in your life, at this event. Maybe it's what you, what you see in hindsight when you look at things at a macro level rather than looking at the micro level on the day-to-day -day basis, the immediate basis in front of your face. So, yeah, look, if, if you know somebody else who's going through something like that, go ahead and share this video with them. I'd, I'd like to think that... Uh, if you don't get something out of this that somebody else does. And uh, subscribe to the channel, obviously, if you haven't done that already, because I've got plenty more videos to come. I'll provide the links down below as well, the link to the clip that I'm talking about from Mary Poppins, and also the link to the article where I expand a bit more on, uh, on the, the decision that I made when I was 25. The decision that I made that I was going to change things, whatever it took, and the results of that. So I'll leave you with that one today, guys. Uh, as I said, like and like this video, share this video, and subscribe to this channel if you haven't done already. And I'll talk to you again soon. Catch you later.